welcome to blowing your doors off. Thank you. I'm your host, Ethan Gomberg. Now, the coronavirus crisis has tested not only the leadership qualities of world leaders, but also some of the largest institutions and associations across the nation, including the sports world. The decision by Adam Silver to suspend the NBA season when he did may have slowed the spread of the virus in sports. However, not all leaders across the sports world had the same response as Silver. The NCAA in particular, with Mark Emmert as the commissioner, hesitated to take action to cancel the tournaments. And this example of his lack of transparency is an all too familiar pattern in college sports. Part of the hesitation to cancel the events may be in part due to this startling fact. In 2018, March Madness brought in more than 97 million viewers and was watched in more than 180 countries. March Madness also hit $1.32 billion in TV ad spending in 2018. Compare that to other sports' this postseason, March Madness beat out the NBA, MLB, and college football. And the current contract for March Madness with CBS and Turner Broadcasting is for how many years and how much money? It's 14 years and it's $10.8 billion. $10.8 billion. It's about $700 million a year. That's a lot of money. It is. It is, yes. And there isn't something necessarily wrong about a tournament bringing in that amount of money. But there is something wrong with where that money ends up. The NCAA redistributes the money it makes from March Madness to over a thousand schools across 24 sports in three divisions. Nearly half a million student athletes currently compete in college sports. And the whole system stems from a guy named Sonny Vaccaro, who's kind of like the charming Italian mob boss everyone loved back in the day, but knows he did some real shady stuff. You made it possible, this commercialization, no? Yes. You're the guy who supplied the money. Yeah. But for decades, Vaccaro has been critical of the way the NCAA does business. He says that while many make millions, the people we tune in to watch, the players, get shortchanged. I know that the kids aren't treated fairly. That's what I know is wrong. Everybody's making money. Everybody, except the kids. <laughs> and it's not just by prohibiting compensation. In order to be eligible, student athletes have to sign an agreement stating that they abide by this 400-page manual. And some of these restric restrictions are straight up cruel. In 2013, the University of Oklahoma reported a long list of violations committed by their athletic department, but one really stood out. The violation from the school stated, three current student athletes received food in excess of NCAA regulation at a graduation banquet. The players were provided pasta in excess of the permissible amount allowed. So the resolution, the three players were required to donate $3.83 each, which is the cost of the pasta serving, to a charity of their choice in order to be reinstated. Now, the NCA said they didn't make that rule or order the ensuing punishment and insisted they were both determined by the university. But the Oklahoman pointed out that the school had likely been responding to an NCAA bylaw called incidental benefits reasonable refreshments. Because the pasta constituted a full meal and not a snack, Oklahoma wanted to be extra vigilant. And I could go on with plenty more examples of petty rules like that. But to sum it up, the NCAA is pretty much like the Dolores Umbridge of making up rules. So to the student athletes who haven't read the 400 page manual, listen to this. Study hard and you will be rewarded fail to do so, and the consequences may be severe. <laughs> All right, back to the real stuff. Part of the reason they're able to bring in money on that level is because of the way in which the NCAA advertises. Now, I thought we'd take a look at the top three best bowl names in college football history, brought to you by Werner, the official ladder of the NCAA. First, an honorable mention. It's Ohio and East Carolina and the Beef O'Brady's Bowl in Tampa on December the 23rd. Later this month, our home team, the USF Bulls, will take on the Marshall 
Thundering Herd and the bad boy mower Gasparilla Bowl. That is a mouthful. And this is at Raymond James. I've got Executive Director Brett Delaney here telling me a little bit about the game. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It is a mouthful. <laughs> you know, got to get those sponsors in. We do. So and it turned out for the bad boy mowers Gasparilla Bowl, football wasn't the only competition. That is one bad, bad boy. <laughs> and it's also great exposure for the main competitor to my new business, Good Girl Mowers. Welcome to the 2014 San Diego County Credit Union Frank Seti Award. Mountain West Network Studio talking San Diego County Credit Union Poinsettia Bowl. San Diego County Credit Union <gasps> Poinsettia Bowl. You just gotta like take a breath in between. And at number one, we have the Hooker Furniture Anal Tech Come and Go Bowl. All right, all right, that last one we made up. But I would like to point out, those all are real companies. All right, let's see what a day in the life of a student athlete looks like now, according to the NCAA. If you have the talent and dedication to succeed in school and in sports, we'll provide the opportunity. This video has received some harsh criticism, and deservedly so. However, what it means to be a college athlete could radically change given new bills that are being introduced. But let's start with some background. Now, the NCAA has argued that amateurism keeps it from becoming a competitive trust. But what is this term amateurism? In the D1 handbook, the NCA states that student athletes shall be amateurs in an intercollegiate sport and their participation should be motivated primarily by education and by the physical, mental, and social benefits to be derived, which is incidentally exactly what my doctor tells me exercise will do to me at a yearly checkup. Yet here we are. <laughs> then went on to say that Student participation in intercollegiate athletics is an avocation. But keep in mind, an avocation is defined as a hobby or minor occupation. So let's hear what Oliver Luck, the NCAA's VP of Regulatory Affairs, has to say about the time commitment of student athletes. Challenging. Also, consider this. We don't talk much about time demands for student athletes. Jay knows how hard it was to get through school and play basketball. I, I did as well as a college student. You've got a triangle. You've got your academics, you have your athletics, and you have your social life, right? The triangle. If you add a, turn that triangle into a square and add another component of marketing, promoting yourself, uh, there's just simply no time for a student to do that. So what he's saying is that triangles we can handle, but squares, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> now. You might be thinking, what about Olympians? You know, they can make money. But the NCAA argues that amateurism on the collegiate level differs from amateurism on the Olympic level because it does this. Uh, but there's complete agreement that amateurism does, in fact, foster and promote the values of education. We have athletics as an integral part of the educational process because we believe in the value of that. So he's emphasizing the education piece. But I had a chance to sit down with Stanford grad and pro football player Richard Sherman. Richard, are students even able to receive the full value of that education? Great question. I really appreciate that question. Oh, Richard, please. No, no need to flatter me. Um, no, no, I don't think college athletes are given enough time to really take advantage of, of the free education that they're given. Um, and it's frustrating. You wake up in the morning, you have weights at this time. Then after weights, you go to class. And after class, you go, you go maybe 
try to grab you a quick bite to eat. Then after you get your quick bite to eat, you go straight to meetings. And after meetings, you got practice. You know, show me how you're gonna going to get all your work done when you when after you know you get out at 7:30 or so, you got to test the next day. You're dead tired from practice, and you still have to study just as hard as everybody else every day and get every, all the same work done. And in a survey conducted by the Pac-12, student athletes were too exhausted to study effectively. And 54% of them say they do not have enough time to study for tests, while 80% of Pac-12 athletes say they have missed a class for competition during the 2015 academic year, with practices serving as a barrier to attendance as well. And because they spend 50 hours a week on athletics, and while they feel they have the resources to succeed, they don't have the time to do so. Now, schools argue that they compensate students through scholarship and free gear, but their generosity only goes so far. After the March Madness victory last year, students decided to bring home a souvenir. Red Raiders forward Tariq Owens said he admired the rug the moment he set foot in the Honda Center locker room. I want it, said Mr. Owens, said. I ain't gonna lie, I'm plotting on it. He leaned over and stroked the mat's fibers. It's a great rug. Thank you, ESPN, for that detailed reporting. One player even went as far as to threaten the NCAA. Give us the ability to make money off our own name, and we'll give you your rug back. You have 24 hours. I will get into what later ensued, but we simply don't have enough time. To learn more, search the great rug extraction of 2019. But back to the millions that the schools bring in, though. Where does that money go? Our college athletes fuel the $14 billion industry that literally makes money for countless companies and agents and almost nothing for the athletes themselves. When universities are not turning their coaches into millionaires, they pump millions of dollars into lavish new athletic facilities. And he's right. Just look at this clip of the University of Texas's facilities. But the millions that go into the facilities is what should be in the pockets of those athletes. In fact, University of Texas football players, the ones you just saw going crazy, are denied $2.2 million, incur scholarship shortfalls of over $14,000, and live below the federal poverty line by $784 per year between 2011 and 2015. Here's my reaction when I first heard those numbers. And if you're thinking, ah, uh, they'll just get rich once they become professionals, under 2% of college athletes end up in the pros. Now, there is some controversy surrounding a free market compensation method. In fact, a bill popped up in California, which would allow students' ability to now profit off of NIL. I see what you did there, NCA. But NIL stands for Name, Image, and Likeness. My name is Nancy Skinner. I'm a state senator from California, and I have introduced a bill which would give college athletes the right to their name, image, and likeness. Let's take Caitlin Ohashi, the incredible gymnast at UCLA. If she tried to monetize her YouTube viewership, she'd be kicked out of NC2A. Whereas if I were uh, clever enough and had some skills on a trampoline or something and I got that many viewers, I could make money off of it. So that's really what we're doing is giving college athletes the right that all the rest of us have. I love how they give Nancy Skinner the basketball intro. Like she's about to drop 30 on Mark Emmert. Skin him alive, Skinner. But she makes a great point with the disparity between a college athlete like Caitlin Ohashi versus a YouTube producer. Take this video of someone who's got some pretty impressive skills on a trampoline. Let's call them Ellie. Now, that video has six million views, which can generate a little over 10 grand. But if Ellie the Elephant were enrolled at, say, 
UCLA, like Caitlin, <laughs> poor Ellie wouldn't receive a penny. I mean, sure, she'd be receiving a world-class education, but, if, but Ellie would be too damn tired to study because of all the training she's been doing. Hashtag, give those trunks a break. Hashtag, Ellie deserves compensation for name, image, and likeness. Because she has a family to feed. Because she eats a lot of food. Because she's an elephant. All right, back to it. That's true. Excitement on the court from Creighton players at the possibility of cashing in on the Fair Pay to Play Act. A lot of athletes, I think, uh, we struggle like financially with money, and uh, we really do spend a lot of time with just playing hoops, going to school. If passed, Nebraska would become the second state to let players make money from their name, photo, or even social media sponsorship. Megan Hunt, the senator who wrote the bill, says it will put college athletes on par with their fellow students. Student athletes are the only college students who are currently prohibited from earning an income from their own skills or talent. And so people need to understand that this is really about economic equality. It's about economic freedom. FaceTime lady brings up a great point. <laughs> Students have the ability to receive a part-time income because they can work on the side, while student athletes have their entire time filled up with their sport. So great, why would there be resistance to this bill? Opponents to the bill worry it'll change players' motivation in choosing a school. He will sit there and tell the parents, I can get your kid 150,000. Then the Alabama one will come in and say, I can get him 200,000. It'll be a bidding war. Oh no, people getting compensated for their labor in a free market? How dare they? But I don't want to take advice from Carl from the movie Up Here. We actually did some digging on Senator Groan, and what we found will make you, well, groan. Some background on the senator. He opposed a bill that would put a social worker in schools across the state to address mental health concerns, yet spent multiple hours on a horse massage bill which will require anyone who does horse massages for compensation to show evidence of a degree and more. And yes, I'm thinking exactly what you are. These two issues could be solved together in under 10 seconds. I mean, it's simple. You assign one horse and one horse massage therapist to each school. So students struggling with mental health can receive treatment by horse massage licensed therapist. Boom, case closed. It gets better though, because in a strongly worded email, in which a constituent pointed out this shortcoming, Senator Groan emailed back in a classy response. There are three ladies in Lincoln County that will be opening separate equine massage clinics now that we have removed regulatory barriers. I am considering having her contact you. For you see, equine includes zebras, horses, mules, donkeys, and asses. Since you fit one of those categories, those ladies will now legally be able to help you. What do you got to counter that lady, huh? All right, but Skinner's fair pay to play bill was actually signed into law this past September. I don't want to say this is checkmate, but this is a major problem for the NC2A. You obviously brought the well, bill here with you today. Man. When you put pen to paper right now, what's this going to change and what's it going to do? It's going to initiate dozens of other states to introduce similar legislation and it's going to change college sports for the better by having now the interests finally of the athletes on par with the in interests of the institutions now we're rebalancing that power arrangement all right well let's do it let's all do you it. ready yeah, let's do it man all right i love how this is filmed at a barber shop I mean, poor Ed O'Bannon's looking around like, damn, this place is foreign to me. Get it? Because he's bald. Now, the bill would allow student athletes compensation for signing autographs, social media sponsorships, or even promoting companies like the Pow Facial Fitness Trainer. But unfortunately, this hasn't served as the much anticipated straw that broke the camel's back, because once again, you guessed it, the NCAA. Now, after it was signed into law in California this past September, the NCAA's initial stance was to ban any California school from competition if they followed it. They also countered that the Fair Pay to Play Act would be unconstitutional in violation of interstate commerce, which the federal government has control over. And it was only after similar bills were introduced across 30 states were they forced between two options, continue to play defense 
and allow state legislators, legislators to set the guidelines for name, image, and likeness, or play offense, taking back their narrative and eliminating pressure by claiming that they supported the change. They picked the latter, the Werner version, of course. <laughs> but we should be highly skeptical of their intent here. Stephen A. Smith summed it up pretty well. Nobody should be applauding the NCAA here. A matter of fact, I think they should receive more of our ire because it shows that they truly, truly know what the right thing is to do. They just don't want to do it until their hand is absolutely positively false. So as far as I'm concerned, it's just a mechanism that has been put in place to further expose their hypocrisy, their lack of, of, of sensitivity to the plight of the student athlete, that they will continue to abuse these student athletes at every turn. For once, I can actually comprehend and agree with Stephen A's take here. Here are some takes I have more of an issue with. For crying out loud, and you talking to us about patience? Don't hear him about no patience. Patience? It's 1973 since the New York Knicks won a title. We're talking about Walt Clyde Frazier. I'm talking about when they actually liked his outfits. We're talking about Willis Reed. <laughs> Just watch. Oh my God! An owner says he owns his team. That's offensive to people. Y'all, y'all smoking crack. <laughs> Something is wrong with you people. What the hell has this world come to? And by the way, ESP, don't even try to get me to do anything with it. I'll quit first. I can't. I, can, I just cannot take. I, 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 I just. I, I can't take it. Just the thought of it makes me stutter. As part of their response. The NCAA formed a Student Athlete Advisory Committee with the subcommittee called the D1 Name, Image, and Likeness Legislative Solutions Working Group. But this group is made up of three previous student athletes who have all graduated. One of them, a golf player, which incidentally is relevant to the title of our future segment, Is Golf a Sport? It's not. <laughs> but let's look into that subcommittee. The Division I National Student Athlete Advisory Committee is made up of 31 members. There's one member from each Division I conference in the nation. And so our duty is to go back through the conference SACs and the institutional SACs and get the feedback, any concerns that student athletes may have, anything that they want to talk about and be their voice on a national level. So what he's basically saying is a basketball player SAC reports to a volleyball SAC member and then consults with a softball player in the institutional SAC creating one big ball sack. <laughs> but the point is, there's no way 31 student athletes can speak for over 500,000, especially when they only have two meetings a year and when one of them is spent doing this. As student leaders within the NCAA governance structure, these 31 individuals have an important role to lead and set the precedent for all D1 student athletes. When they came to Indianapolis in July 2012 for their biannual meeting, Division I SAC wanted to pay it forward within the local community and held a barefoot bowling event. Ew. All right, first of all, nobody wants to see those bare feet. And second, <laughs> This example of the NCAA's refusal to change the status quo is all too familiar, even as external pressure rises. Now, a poll revealed that 66% of the public endorsed allowing college athletes to be paid, and it could be an easy bipartisan effort in Congress. And I know that sentence is an oxymoron, but this would be unprecedented and life-altering for these student athletes. Senator Blumenthal of Connecticut summed it up pretty well. Across the country, college athletes are being taken advantage of by a financial model that has allowed the NCAA and its members to profit off athletes' names, images, and likenesses without allowing those athletes to receive any compensation. And they can have their scholarships revoked in the event of a college and career-ending injury. This system is deeply unfair. The fact of the matter is this, the NCAA and its colleges will continue to fight to keep the status quo by lobbying lawmakers, putting out vague media statements with empty promises, and saying similar things that my ex does. It's a complex topic. The answers aren't uh, cut and dried. They're asking one of the most important and complex questions uh, have complicated these efforts. The NCAA claims that college athlete NIL reform has been 
too complicated to address is further evidence that they are both unwilling and ill-equipped to do so. Reform is not too complicated to achieve, and justice for student athletes should not be delayed any longer. These athletes sacrifice their physical and mental health and dedicate years of their lives to perfecting their sport. They deserve to be compensated for it. But to foster that support, we thought it might be beneficial to portray a more accurate version of what a day in the life of a student athlete really looks like, so that student athletes who generate billions have something more valuable than a rug to bring home. violating an NCAA bylaw. If you take one more bite of that pasta, it'll constitute a full meal and I'll have to revoke your scholarship. If you have the dedication and talent to succeed in school and in sports, we're gonna make a lot of money off your ass. <laughs> 